Good afternoon, Chairman Puro, Board of Trustees, faculty, parents, friends, and the graduating class of 2013. I'm a proud Dallin graduate, and I'm very humbled speaking before you today. But I must admit, writing a commencement speech is almost as difficult as writing a dissertation. I really considered sending my speech to Dr. Perry and Dr. Marote, who were my chair in design, but I thought very carefully about that because I figured they'd send me a thousand edits and inform me on Friday and tell me I wasn't ready. So I decided not to do that. What I did do was uh, take Dr. Tatum's advice and marinate my speech after I wrote it. But since I do remember what it's like to sit through commencement speeches, I will be brief in my words. I have been taught a life lesson in perseverance and determination, and I would like to share that with you today. Thomas A. Edison said, many of life's failures are people who did not realize how close they were to success when they gave up. I learned at a very young age about the importance of a college education. My mom and dad both returned back to school later in life. My dad worked on Rikers Island and would go to school after work. And my mom, like the typical woman, had many chores and many responsibilities, worked with the Board of Education. And I barely remember my brother and I meeting her at her job taking the city bus, quickly eating dinner, and then back on that bus to go to her school. My brother and I would often sit outside her classroom and do our homework. It was extremely difficult on both of them, but they never gave up. Seeing my dad earn two master's degrees and my mom a baccalaureate was truly inspirational. My journey towards pursuing my education was a very unusual one. Upon graduating from an old boys Catholic high school in the South Bronx, I attended a community college in Brooklyn to pursue an associate's degree. And I must admit that my time at community college was more fun than focused. I played on the baseball team with hopes of, be, of going to a four-year college and eventually playing for the New York Yankees. My short-term plan was not a degree but playing professional baseball. I was very passionate about this dream of mine, which evolved even more when I was a young boy playing stickball on the New York City streets. And when I served as a bat boy for the New York Yankees for two seasons as a teenager, there was no other goal but to become a professional baseball player. And just to tell you a real quick story, because I know we have a few Yankee fans out there, when you walk into the Yankee locker room back then, and this was the old Yankee Stadium, it was rich in tradition and history. And when you walked into that locker room, you had Reggie Jackson's locker to the left-hand side, you had Greg Nettles to the right-hand side, and as you walked deeper into the locker room, you had Thurman Munson's locker right before you entered the training room, and you had Catfish Hunter right before you entered the Players' Lounge. So one day in 1979, as a teenage kid would, do, kid would do, I got to the stadium early. Back then, the games were at 8 o'clock. They weren't 7 o'clock like they are now. So what I did was I got to the stadium around 12 or 1 o'clock, and I went into the Players' Lounge because it was filled with candy and soda and food, and sat there and watched TV. And this young kid, who's about 9 or 10, comes in and he sits next to me. And it wasn't uncommon to have players' children come into the locker room. So this young kid sits next to me and he elbows me. So I look at him and I elbow him back. He looks at me, he elbows me, I elbow him. Next thing you know, he's pushing me, I'm pushing him, and we're in this shoving match. And this goes on for a couple of minutes. And finally, I take the kid and gently just drop him right on the couch. So we're laying there on the couch and we fall to the floor and I'm sitting there, we're both puffing and puffing. And I said, what's your name? So he says, how? So I continue watching TV and I said, what's your last name? He said, Steinbrenner. I said, uh oh. Naturally, I was a little concerned about job security. However, becoming a professional baseball player was not my destiny, for the most part, because I wasn't good enough. I'm not embarrassed to say I was not going to be another Willie Mays or Ricky Mansell. Not sure of what I wanted to do with my life and my dream gone. I followed in my father's footsteps and entered the New York City Correction Department. I had a stellar career for almost 22 years, and I was assigned for 12 years in the emergency service unit and three years as, as a captain in the firearms and tactics unit. During my career, I responded to bomb threats, escapes, riots, hostage situations, gun jobs, the World Trade Center bombing in 1993, and the attacks of September 11, 2001. Dealing with emergencies and making split-second, life-and-death decisions was stressful, yet it was probably the most exciting time in my life. And little did I know it was providing the beginning framework for my future. I felt like my life was on a steady path. I had a family, we purchased a house, and we were settling in, things were working out. 
But life has a strange way of teaching you things that you can never learn in a classroom. In March of 1996, I noticed I was losing weight and my appetite. I did not think anything of it initially because I was working so many hours, but I started having night sweats. And not just regular night sweats. The night sweats were so severe that I actually would wring out my shirt every morning. I decided to seek medical attention and after several tests, I was diagnosed with cancer, Hodgkin's lymphoma. Of course, I was floored. My life was turned upside down. I thought to myself, would I ever see my sons graduate from ground school? And of course, I asked the age-old question, why me? Because my cancer was progressive, an aggressive treatment protocol was established with chemotherapy and radiation. I went through with it and thankfully recovered successfully and knew I would win this battle. I returned back to work in the summer of 1998. Having my health back gave me great pause as to what should I do next. I felt I was given a second chance and I wanted to do something with it. It is hard to explain how you look at life when you come so close to losing it. I wanted to make sure I lived life to the fullest. I started a security consulting company with a friend of mine with big dreams. We were very successful obtaining Essence Communications and several other big name clients. My life was going great as I looked forward to retirement and focusing all of my efforts on my company. I was happy and optimistic. Life was good. But life wasn't done with me. This was not the happy ending I had hoped for. Life had another lesson to teach me. As a cancer survivor, you must follow up with annual routine diagnostic testing to make sure that there's no reoccurrence. In December of 2003, after one of those routine tests, it was discovered that I had a mass on my pancreas. And after two consultations with distinguished hospitals, in New York City and Long Island, the diagnosis was confirmed. I had pancreatic cancer. Once again, my life stopped in its tracks and I was forced yet again with the question, would I see my sons graduate from high school? I was scheduled for 10 hours of surgery to remove the mass. As if this wasn't bad enough, I was told the survival rate of this surgery was 0.005%. So in preparation for the surgery, I got all my affairs in order and spent as much time as I could with my family. I will forever remember the morning I went to the hospital and was prepped for surgery. When I was wheeled on the gurney to the elevator to take me up for surgery, my mom, dad, and wife were all walking with me. It is still a vivid picture etched forever in my memory as we said I love you for possibly the last time. Thankfully, I survived the surgery and with it another major health scare. This diagnosis, as we all know, is fatal 98% of the time. My recovery was difficult and painful as the surgery required the removal of a few organs and a resection of several others. But as my story goes, which some classify as a horror story, it did not end. Six weeks after the surgery, I got sick again. And after several trips to the hospital and more diagnostic testing, I was informed I needed a liver transplant within a year or I would not survive. A catheter was inserted in my liver and I was sent home to wait to be placed on the transplant list. Unfortunately, the catheter was placed incorrectly and I developed several infections and my temperature rose to 105 degrees. More hospitalizations and more doctors, but I was able to walk away without a liver transplant. When someone goes through a battle with cancer, as I am sure we all know who had, someone who has fought this illness, you start to look at life differently. I had a choice, like Neo had in the movie The Matrix. Take the red pill and continue to feel sorry for myself, be depressed and give up, or take the blue pill and do something with my life. My mom, dad, and wife encouraged me to return to school to help me focus and get me out of this deep depression I was in. I retired from New York City Corrections and enrolled in college. I found college to be challenging, but also very interesting. Most notable was the culture shock because I had been away from college for almost 22 years. Seeing students walking on campus on their cell phones and wearing pajamas to class was quite different than life on, camp on a college campus back in 1982. Also, I learned that I had an option of utilizing the resources in the library or something called Google. I found the academic environment to be therapeutic. It took my mind off my health issues and made me focus on the task at hand, learning. I could have sought counseling for my depression, but the challenge of school was my medicine and also became my addiction. In my last semester of my undergraduate studies, I took ill again and was back with the medical community. I was diagnosed with the cardiac tamponade, which is fluid around your heart and had to have a pericardial window placed in my heart. 
After receiving my bachelor's degree, I just had to keep going and I found Dowling College for my graduate studies. The cohort model's small classroom size and personal interaction with classmates and professors helped me easily adapt into the graduate program. I enjoyed my studies at Dowling College and still felt the desire to continue challenging myself. I started to pursue a second master's degree in Homeland Security Management at Long Island University. And in the middle of the program, I thought, why not just go for it all? I applied to Dowling's doctoral program, finishing up credits to receive an advanced degree in Homeland Security Management. And just a piece of advice, there is nothing more difficult than being in two colleges in two different programs simultaneously. <laughs> but I had one more date with the medical community. My first weekend class in, doctor in the doctoral program, I took ill again. My classmates found me on both knees in the parking lot right behind me. They helped me inside the building and offered to call for medical assistance. I told them no thanks, and I did what any husband would do. I called my wife. She and my son made it from Lake Grove to this campus in eight minutes. Because I had had a timeshare at that time, that's what I felt, at St. Catherine's Hospital, all the hosp because of all the hospitalizations I had there, I wanted to go there. And after a week in a hospital with an illness they could not diagnose, I returned home and back to school. And I would like to thank Dr. and Sarah for calling me quite frequently as a new student just to check up on me. And the rest is history. I have to admit that at any given moment, I expect the life to hit me again with the medical condition or another hurdle. I am being honest with you this afternoon when I say I sometimes find myself wondering what is next. So I stand before you 10 years later after the most difficult and challenging times of my life. I'm a kid from the South Bronx who persevered through horrific medical diagnosis and is determined to do great things with his life. And I will never stop achieving because I will always find new challenges. I am most proud to say after all that has occurred, I have watched my sons graduate from grammar school, high school, and college. My life in public service, which is my passion, continues as I am now the Assistant Deputy County Executive for Public Safety in Suffolk County. As of April 1st, 2013, the United States had a total resident population of 315,828,000. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, around 9% of the U.S. population holds a master's degree and 1% a doctoral degree. Think about that. You are in the ninth and first percentile in academic achievement across this entire great land of ours. All of you and your families have made a tough decision to pursue your education. Everyone here has the tools and talents to succeed. You can do great things with your life, far greater than you ever imagined. You, you accomplish your academic goals only to start a new chapter in your life. You will see how pursuing your graduate or terminal degree will open new and exciting opportunities. It may not come as fast as you like, but it will come. There may be obstacles ahead, some small, some large, that will make you question whether or not you can make it through it. Do not worry about failing. Have the guts to challenge yourself and accomplish the impossible. Remember, to get something you never had, you have to do something you never did. Always continue to work hard and be honest with yourself, but don't stop now. And in conclusion, as we go forward, just remember, life is unfair. Rashomon, as Dr. Rod Gardeker would always tell me. Don't let anything stop you. I've learned to love myself because if you don't, why would anyone else do so? Never stop learning. Take breaks, but don't stop learning. Live your life with great integrity and respect others. Rise to the challenge in everything you do, no matter how small or how large the task. Thank your family, friends, and faculty who have supported you. Be proud of your accomplishments. You earned and deserve it. You are a Downey graduate. Steve Jobs said in 2005, Stanford University commencement, your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. Stay hungry, stay foolish. Thank you and congratulations.
Thank you, Dr. Sula.